Hi, I'm Cynthia Lacon, and I'm an associate professor in the public health program at University of California, Irvine. My research attempts to explain why there is a relationship between social networks and health behavior, primarily among adolescents. I focus on creating and testing theoretical models of social and cognitive mechanisms linking adolescent social networks and drug use behaviors. I'd like to introduce my research team, Professor Carter Butts, Professor John Hip, Dr. Chang Wang, and Ms. Rupa Jones. I'm Carter Butts. I'm a professor here at the University of California, Irvine, in the departments of Sociology, Statistics, and Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. My research is primarily in the area of social networks, as well as in computational and Bayesian statistics. Hi, I'm John Hip. I'm a professor in the Department of Criminology, Law, and Society here at UC Irvine. I study neighborhoods and how they change, and I also study the spatial distribution of crime in cities. Hi, my name is Rupa Jose. I am a graduate student in the Psychology and Social Behavior Department here at UCI. My research mainly focuses on the social and the physical environment and how that influences health outcomes, such as the mental health of women who've been exposed to domestic violence, um, post-disaster health and recovery, and um, delinquency and criminal engagement. My name is Chen Wan. I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate at the Department of Sociology, Cornell University. My research is focused on complex network analysis, computational social science, and stats and methods. We can think of these people as being in my personal social network. We are all linked in numerous ways. For example, Chang Wing was my postdoctoral scholar. We can also take into account the connections between the people connected to me. For example, Carter Butts and John Hip worked together on an NSF-funded project, and Chang Wing has collaborated as part of Carter Butts' lab while he was my postdoc. Rupa Joes is also a member of John Hip's lab as well as my own, and if we consider the larger networks that we're all in, the picture gets even more complex. Understanding complexity in networks was the motivation for a recent study my team and I conducted using two adolescent U.S. high school-based networks. During adolescence, smoking behavior and friendship choices co-evolve as youth move into and out of peer groups and concurrently make decisions about smoking. Also, youth strive to be similar to friends on many different dimensions, including smoking. So an important question for researchers has been, does smoking behavior similarity among adolescents happen because youth choose to be like their friends, which might be due to peer influence, or is it because they choose friends similar to themselves on smoking behavior, which is peer selection? So in an environment wherein peer influence and selection are constantly working, do these processes result in forces that encourage or discourage smoking? Conventional wisdom might suggest that youth influence each other to smoke, but is that correct? Adolescents, like all of us, are susceptible to peer influence. Within friendship networks, youth may adopt health-compromising behavior if their friends do these behaviors. We might think of this as the bad apple theory, and one bad apple can spoil the bunch. This is the idea behind contagion theory. However, it is also the case that adolescents are likely to engage in health-promotive behaviors if their friends do. Alternatively, it's possible that adolescents choose friends who are similar to themselves on smoking behavior. We explored how changes in peer influence and selection affect individual and school smoking levels. However, a real challenge we faced in understanding the effects of these processes is that there are numerous other social processes going on simultaneously in adolescent networks. For example, adolescents choose other adolescents as friends if they reciprocate the friendship. This is reciprocity. And adolescents will become friends with a friend of a friend. This is transitivity. To understand these evolving networks, we built agent-based statistical models using a program called Siena that considers adolescents' decisions about whom to be friends with and whether or not to smoke simultaneously. We estimated the model on the two largest schools from the over sample from the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health, Ad Health, containing network information of 3,145 youths in grades 9 through 12 surveyed three times during the period of 1994 to 1996. This allowed us to identify and calibrate the different mechanisms driving those two behaviors. However, how can we tell just how important each of these effects is in driving smoking? Our strategy used the parameter estimates from our models as the basis for a simulation study. One power of a simulation study is the ability to turn social processes on and off or make them stronger than they really are. 
For each experimental condition, we simulated the network forward a thousand times. We can then observe the consequences for network ties and smoking behavior in this simulated context. This helps us answer the key question of interest here, which is whether peer influence is risk promotive or risk protective for smoking. So what did we observe? This graph shows the distribution of smoking that actually occurred in one of our schools. In this school, about 74% of students are non-smokers, whereas about 10% are heavy smokers. But what happens when we turn the peer influence effect down? If influence promotes smoking, we should find that if we turn it off, there should be less smoking in a network. Contrary to the bad apple theory, when there is no influence effect, our simulation shows there will be, in fact, fewer non-smokers and more heavy smokers. When we set peer influence to zero, overall levels of smoking in the school increased. This suggests that influence is actually a protective effect. So if we turn up the knob on influence, we should see less smoking. And this is what we saw. In a hypothetical world with very strong peer influence effects, five times stronger than in the actual network, we would actually see more non-smokers, as 90% do not smoke, and we see fewer smokers. The pattern is similar in the school with more smoking behavior. Whereas about 50% are non-smokers and 30% are heavy smokers, when we turn off the influence effect, we see fewer non-smokers and more heavy smokers. And when we turn up influence to a very strong effect, there are now more non-smokers, about 70%, and fewer heavy smokers. What about peer selection? It really did not impact the overall level of smoking in the school when we turned it off or when we turned it up. High levels of peer selection did impact the extent of clustering of smoking behavior in the two networks, particularly in the school with a high smoking prevalence. We then did an experiment in which we turned both knobs at the same time. That is, we varied peer influence and peer selection simultaneously. We found that the effect of increasing influence dominates the effect of stronger selection and still is risk protective. When we asked what percentage of youth smoked at any level by the end of the simulation, we found that as we increased the strength of the influence effect, moving from left to right on the graph, the percentage of smokers in the school at the end of the simulation run systematically decreases. However, as we change the strength of the selection effect, the different lines in the figure, there are almost no changes as the lines are almost on top of each other. We also asked how the simultaneous manipulation of influence and selection affected the percentage of youth who start smoking at any level by the end of the simulation. In the lower smoking prevalence school, as we manipulated the influence parameter to larger values, the percentage of adolescents who begin smoking steadily decreased regardless of the size of the selection parameter. It appears that stronger selection effects do not increase the number of new smokers in this school with the lower levels of smoking behavior in general. However, in the higher smoking school, we detect strong reinforcing effects, whereas stronger influence effects result in a smaller proportion of smoking initiators. This inhibitory effect is strongest when it is accompanied by a strong selection effect in the context of relatively many smokers available and leads to the greatest reduction in smoking initiation. When we asked how the simultaneous manipulation of influence and selection affected the percentage of youth who stopped smoking by the end of the simulation, we found for the lower smoking school that stronger influence effects monotonically increase the number who stop smoking. In the high smoking school, we again see an interaction effect, whereas altering the influence parameter to larger values results in greater levels of smoking cessation. This effect is enhanced when the selection parameter is turned off. Thus, in a school with relatively high levels of smoking, higher levels of influence with no selection results in greater levels of youth ceasing to smoke. How do we make sense of our results? How can smokers influence others to smoke, but then smoking diminishes at the school level? The key point is the proportion of non-smokers in the population. Let's think about the social network system as a whole. This plot shows the percentage of smokers in the personal network of each person in our school with higher smoking prevalence. This line delineates those whose networks are majority smokers versus those that are majority non-smokers. Notice how different these two groups are in size. Thus, most students are being influenced by peers who are non-smokers rather than smokers. This pattern is even more stark in the school with lower smoking prevalence. Adolescents who do smoke likely influence friends to smoke. However, because this behavior is rare in our sample, the net effect of peer influence is to pull everyone towards not smoking or less smoking. So in this case, peer influence appears to spread salutary socialization influences which diminish smoking. This runs contrary to the sometimes implicit assumption that an adolescent smoker may induce a non-smoker to begin smoking. 
and thus places less emphasis on the possibility that a non-smoker may induce a smoker to stop smoking. The latter scenario is likely a consequence of anti-smoking norms held by the majority in a school, and when peer influences aligned with these anti-smoking norms are strengthened, smoking behavior decreases at the school level. Our findings have important implications for how we think about smoking prevention for adolescents. Interventionists should consider leveraging the salutary socialization effects of anti-smoking peer influences held by majorities in adolescent mainstream populations to propagate the chain of influence in the direction of decreasing or eliminating smoking. In general, a simulation strategy such as the one used in this study can explore the implications of altering network processes for adolescent smoking and other behaviors in a contained social system like a school to inform interventions. Simulation studies such as this offer important insights for adolescent smoking and a vantage point into how adolescents' individual decisions affect a uniquely complex social system.